up till now we discussed the various components which are required for a optical communication link in the beginning we discussed the medium which is optical fiber we saw that on fiber when the signal is transmitted there is a distortion and also attenuation and distortion is characterized by the dispersion parameter then we saw on the transmitter side we have a device what is called the optical source which could be an led or which could be a laser diode and then these devices have certain characteristics they have a spectral width they have a finite bandwidth they have some efficiency factors and then on the other side of the optical communication link we have a optical detector and amplifiers and all together we call that as a receiver and we saw its characteristics the contribution of noise how do we calculate the bit error rate which is a performance parameter for the digital data so up till now essentially we have covered most of the primary components which are required for designing an optical communication link so in fact after learning in depth these different modules of the optical communication system the topic what is called the optical fiber link design is a rather straight forward topic essentially what we are saying now is that with the knowledge which we have gained regarding different modules how do we assemble together and essentially find out what should be separation between the repeaters when we design a long distance communication link so idea now here is that we have certain performance parameters for optical communication link which could be either ber if it is a digital communication link or it could be signal to noise ratio if it is an analog communication link and then we ask how far can i go so that these parameters do not go below the acceptable limit and at that location when the parameters start deteriorating below the acceptable limit essentially we have to regenerate our data and that's what is done by module what is called a repeater so the link design essentially is finding out the location of the repeaters in a long distance optical communication link so in this lecture essentially we are going to discuss what is called the optical link design so we have here the criteria for designing an optical link and we can design the optical communication link based on certain criteria so we can divide this criteria into two categories one we call as the primary design criteria which is one is of course the bit rate there is essentially the information which i can send on a given link and since the information is going in the form of bits or pulses higher the bit rate means more information transfer but as we have seen that when the bits are transmitted on the optical fiber because of dispersion the bits essentially broaden is a spreading of the pulses and then for a given distance there has to be a minimum separation between the pulses so that they do not overlap with each other so one of the primary criteria for design is what is the data rate we want to send on the required optical link so a user essentially specifies this is the bit rate i would like to transmit on this optical link the second thing over what distance this data is to be sent 
which we call as the link length and this is now essentially related to the loss or the attenuation of the signal on the optical fiber. In addition to this then we can have some more parameters for designing uh, the link. One is what is the modulation format we are going to use. If you are having the television kind of transmission, we can send the signal in the form of analog just to save the bandwidth. If you are sending data, then the signal has to be sent in the digital format. Also within the digital format also, we can use different formats like you can use the amplitude shift keying or we can use the frequency shift keying or the phase shift keying if your laser is a very narrow band laser and we can have the analog modulation which could be amplitude or we can have some kind of a sub carrier modulation and then we can modulate this on the optical carrier. So, this is modulation format would be one of the additional parameters for designing the optical link. Then as we mentioned earlier, we have the parameter what is called system fidelity, which is measured essentially in terms of bit error rate for digital system and the signal to noise ratio for the analog system. In addition to that, for an analog system, we also require the knowledge of what is called the intermodulation products. So, it is not only that the signal should remain above the noise, but the signal should not get distorted because if the signal get distorted, essentially it generates certain frequencies and these frequencies may lie in the neighboring bands and can create interference. So, when we talk about an analog communication link, we also have to talk about what is called the intermodulation products or how linear our system is so that the intermodulation products are as low as possible. Then we have the considerations like cost and the communication link has essentially three cost components. One is the cost of the various modules which are going to be used in the optical communication link. So, the cost of the transmitter, the cost of the fiber and the cost of the receiver. Then we have a cost what is called the installation cost and in this case the installation essentially means laying the fiber optic cable which requires substantial trench work, civil work. So, we have a substantial cost incurred in laying the optical fiber cables and then of course, we have electronic installation which is on the transmitter and receiver side. But in fact, for an optical communication link, the installation cost for transmitter and receiver, they are negligibly small compared to the installation of the optical cable. In fact, whenever the optical cable is laid, the cable does not come with single fiber. Normally, the optical cable has multi cores, so they have multiple fibers. For one communication link, you require only one fiber, but since the installation cost is substantial, when the fiber is laid, normally a multi core fiber is laid, keeping in view that some later date there will be more need for the bandwidth and then the multiple fibers can be useful in meeting that requirement. So, installation cost is one of the major component of the optical communication link. The third thing which is important is the maintenance of this link because the system is going to be laid over a distance of hundreds of kilometers and this is going to go into various environments 
so one requires a good maintenance of this cable so that the communication performance doesn't deteriorate as the time progresses also when we talk about the maintenance of an optical communication link typically we expect that at least the optical fiber which is the passive component of the link should last for 20 to 25 years and that's the reason we incur substantial cost into this because the time scale which we are talking about is quite large then since the technology is not very static and if you look at the advancements which have taken place in the technology there are rapid changes even over a span of about few years so if you design an optical communication link by the end of its life which is 20 years let us say most of the technology is going to be obsolete because electronics is changing very rapidly so what that means is that then we should design the systems electronic systems which are going to be connected to the optical fiber should be easily upgradable that means with minimal change in the systems which are connected on either side of the optical fiber your system should be able to accommodate the new technologies it should be able to accommodate the new requirements on the communication link so there should be good upgradability possible in the fiber optic system and lastly but not least that the component which you are talking about for the link they must be commercially available at low cost because there are always certain restrictions on the component availability so when we design a optical communication link the commercial availability over a sustained period because we have to maintain this link would be one of the important aspects of the design of a communication link once we get these parameters fixed then let us consider the simplest possible link which we call as point to point link that means essentially we have one location where the information is generated and there is another location where the information is to be delivered so we have a source of information and we have a destination for that information and this information has to be carried in the form of light from one location to another location so then we have a simplest possible configuration which is information source which supplies the electronic information to an optical transmitter which essentially consists of a driver and an optical source like led or a laser diode then the optical signal is connected to optical fiber signal travels on the other side the signal is detected by photo detector given to electronic circuit amplifiers decision makers and so on and then you can generate your information back on the receiver side so when we are talking about the point to point link design essentially we are saying that we have to choose these modules we have to choose these modules we have to choose the appropriate optical fiber and then for given values of these parameters for op transmitter and receiver and the fiber find over what distance this information can be sent reliably that essentially is the process for optical link design so let us see if i now go to these modules which we have for the optical link point to point link then on one side we have a transmitter which has optical source optical energy from the source is coupled to the optical fiber through a connector then the optical signal travels 
on the optical fiber. Now, since this length could be the order of about tens of kilometers, the optical fiber does not come in one stretch for that length. So, normally you have a standard spools of optical fiber. So, if you have to lay a long optical fiber, essentially you have to create joints of this optical fiber, what we call splices. So, these are the sections of optical fiber which are joint here in the form of splices and then you go on doing it. There may be certain test points where you have to put connectors so that fiber can be connected or disconnected for measurement purposes. And like this you reach to the other end where again through the connector the optical fiber is connected to the receiver which is photo detector and you convert the light into the electronic form. Now, each of this component which you are seeing here like a connector or fiber section or e splice, each of this essentially contribute to the loss of the optical signal. So, each one essentially has the best parameter for the loss or average parameter for the loss. And when we signal travels on this essentially at every location additional loss takes place at the splice and at the connector. So, now the first step which we have now is to choose the sources on the transmitter side. So, here essentially we are seeing the optical power which you can get for different sources like LEDs or lasers and as you have seen earlier for a LED you can get a power which would be 100 micro watt or few hundred micro watt, but we will not be able to get power more than this because of the efficiency constraints on LED. Whereas, if you go to the laser diode, then we can get power of the order of about few milliwatts. Also, what we know from our earlier anal analysis that this is the power which a laser has, but if you modulate this optical source, then the fluctuating component of light reduces as the frequency of modulation increases. That means, even if the laser is may supply the power as soon as the data rate becomes higher and higher, the effective power supplied by the laser becomes smaller and smaller and same is true for LED because essentially all these are junctions p n junctions which are essentially the low frequency filters. But typically if you are using the laser diode then the transmitter has 1 milliwatt of power and normally the power in optical link design is measured in terms of what is called dBm that means we say 1 milliwatt is taken as a reference power. So, every power is measured with respect to the 1 milliwatt of power. So, if we convert this power in terms of dB ratio, then 1 milliwatt power essentially is 0 dBm and every factor of 10 increase in power, you have a 10 dB increase. So, that means 10 milliwatt of power will be 10 dBm, 100 milliwatt of power will be 20 dBm and so on. Typically, when we talk about the optical receiver transmitters, we typically have the powers which range between minus 3 dBm to about plus 3 dBm. That means about half a milliwatt to about 2 milliwatts. That is the typical power which you will see from the transmitter if you are using a device like laser. 
so as the data rate increases the important thing to note is that the power supplied by the source reduces the same plot also is giving now the minimum detectable power required for a given bit error rate as a function of the data rate or the bit rate so as we have seen in the presence of noise as the data rate increases we have to essentially pump more and more power into the system and we have seen that for the low thermal noise dominated case it goes as a square root of the bandwidth so as the data rate increases essentially the minimum required power increases and that's what is shown here that if we use the simple pin diode or the apd avalanche photo detector then there's a kind of power range which you would need so if you go to about 1000 megabits per second you will require a power of something like minus 40 dbm whereas if you go to 1 gigabits per second which is 1000 megabits per second you would require power about minus 30 dbm so typical power level which the receiver must get to get a ber of typically 10 to the power minus 9 the received power must lie in the range of minus 30 to minus 40 dbm the same thing essentially is shown here there is the receiver sensitivity versus the bit rate so here again we are showing the minimum power required for detection and that is the data rate which is shown here and these are the responses for the different detectors so for the silicon that's the wavelength range indium gallium arsenide which is at works at 1300 nanometer that will be the typical uh, requirement of the power and indium gallium arsenide apd 1550 nanometer that's the power requirement and so on so now i can choose the appropriate photo detector depending upon the band of optical window it could be either 1310 or 1550 and then i can from the data rate which the user has specified for that communication link i can now find out what is the minimum power required on my detector so essentially we have now decided the optical source with certain optical power which it is capable of delivering for that data rate and we also have now the minimum power which we must receive at the detector so that the signal to noise ratio is adequate to give the required bit error rate so essentially now we have got these two quantities what you call ps which is power from the transmitter in dbm and pr which is the sensitivity of the receiver in dbm for a given br for a given data rate so now we are asking a question if these two parameters transmitter and receivers are fixed what is the maximum length of fiber including all splices and connectors over which we can send this signal satisfactorily and this calculation is what is called the power budget calculation so essentially we are accounting for the power losses at various levels in the communication link and those losses must be less than the difference between the transmitted power and the received receiver sensitivity so if we have the transmitted power ps and the received power is pr then the difference between these two is essentially the maximum allowable loss in terms of db so here every quantity in terms of dbm 
So, P s is in D B m, P r is in D B m. So, different of these two gives you in D B that means the loss in terms of D B is P s minus P r. Now, where is the power lost on the optical fiber? The loss power is lost in various components. It is lost in the fiber first of all then some power is lost into the connector then some power is lost into the splices and then normally what we do is we provide some system margin that as the time goes the system performance deteriorate because your detector gets aged so his response goes down his sensitivity changes also because of the aging of the laser the power supplied by the laser keeps changing it reduces as a function of time so as the time progresses the laser power reduces so this quantity ps reduces at the same time pr requirement increases because the sensitivity of the receiver degrades and this must be accounted for while designing the optical link so normally there is some margin left with you what is called the system margin so from here now essentially you want to find out what is the loss in the fibers which is possible so alpha max is known from these ps minus pr and all these connector losses are known of course the splice loss also is proportional to the length in some sense because if you use the fiber spools of standard length and as the length increases the number of splices are also going to increase so typical loss which you will get for the splice would be of the order of about 0.05 db whereas connector may give a loss 0.1 db something like this and a system design the specification generally is that one must keep the system margin which is 6 db so once we know now this quantities we know the maximum allowable loss we know the loss in the connector we know the loss in splices we know the system margin then we can find out what is the maximum loss permitted in the link and once i know that quantity alpha fiber if i divide this quantity by the attenuation constant of the fiber which is loss per kilometer we get the maximum possible length over which the system will behave satisfactorily so this link length or this length we call as the power budget limited link length what that means is that if we send the signal beyond this distance then the signal to noise ratio will go below the acceptable limit and therefore your br will be less than the specified value so the one calculation which one does while designing the optical link is what is called the power budget calculation it is essentially balancing the of the powers at various locations on the optical fiber and that is one limit which you get for the optical link length beyond which the signal to noise ratio is below the acceptable value the same thing has been shown essentially graphically here so we have a power uh, level which you are transmitting then this is the minimum detectable level which has to be met to give for a given ber we are providing about 6 db system margin so that means this is the power difference which is available for loss inside the optical fiber so if there are no other splices and connector essentially the power will decrease linearly and where this line essentially intersects this line that is the length of the fiber 
in kilometers so the one calculation which one does in the optical link design is the power budget limited length which tells us that beyond that length the signal to noise ratio goes below the acceptable limit the second calculation which does which essentially tells you what kind of data rate can be sent is what is called the rise time budget now as we know that the system bandwidth and the rise time of the system are inversely related larger the bandwidth of the system shorter will be the rise time so if you transmit a pulse which has a sharp edge you will see that the sharp transition of the optical pulse if you have a substantially large bandwidth so essentially bandwidth calculation here we are doing in time domain in terms of what is called rise time and the rise time has different components you have a rise time associated with the laser it means how fast the laser can be switched on and off you can have a rise time for the detector again how quickly the detector responds to the fluctuations in the light intensity and then you have the equivalent sort of a blurring of the optical pulse because of dispersion on the optical fiber so we define what is called a system rise time and assuming that these quantities are independent and each one is going to give you a blurring we can define the root mean square value of the rise time and that's what we call as the system uh, rise time which is t system so this is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of the transmitter rise time the rise time associated with the dispersion and the rise time associated with the receiver so d is the dispersion parameter of the optical fiber sigma lambda is the spectral width of the source or the laser or the led which is used for the transmitter and l is the length of the optical link now the standard is that for a satisfactory reception of the bits the system rise time should be less than 70% of the bit duration so if we take the data which is let us say simple an rz data where over one level of the bit the optical intensity remains high for the entire bit duration and for zero the optical intensity is zero then the bit duration which we have is let us say is given by tb so the system rise time should be less than 70% of the bit duration whereas if we consider what are called the return to zero data where the zero is indicated by no light but one is essentially indicated by a pulse of duration of half the bit duration then essentially the effective pulse width will be half of tb bit duration and then the system rise time has to be essentially 0.35 of the bit duration so depending upon what kind of format we are using for the bit transmission the t system will change requirement will change so for a non return to zero the t system has to be 0.7 of tb 
if it is written to 0 data then T system will be less than 0.35 of T B. Once I get that then I can substitute for T system into this and invert this to find out what should be the maximum value of L to get that T system smaller than this quantity. So, if we do that we get L rise time maximum length that essentially is given by 1 upon d dispersion parameter spectral width of the source and this quantity here. Now, in this also generally the transmitter rise time is much much smaller compared to the receiver rise time. The receivers essentially have a bandwidth which is much narrower compared to the transmitter especially if you are using the DFB lasers and that kind of thing. So, normally this is the quantity which is very small compared to the receiver rise time. Nevertheless, once you have these quantities now with us, then we can calculate what is the maximum possible length over which the system rise time will remain less than 0.7 of the bit duration. Or what I be saying in other words is that what is the maximum distance over which the signal distortion remains below the acceptable limit or in other words we are saying beyond this distance R T max the signal distortion will become unacceptable and this length we call as the rise time budget limited link length. So, now we are having two lengths one is the power budget limited other one is the rise time budget limited. Over the power budget limited link length the signal distortion is acceptable it is not excessive, but the signal to noise ratio is unacceptable. Whereas, when I go to this length which is L R T beyond this length the signal distortion becomes unacceptable and signal to noise ratio may be ok. So, in either case whether signal either signal to noise ratio has gone below the acceptable value or the distortion has become unbearable we have to regenerate our data. So, essentially smaller of the two this value L p maximum or this quantity L r t maximum whichever is smaller of these two that is the location where we have to regenerate our data and invariably it so happens that the power budget limited length is much smaller compared to the rise time budget length. So, invariably you have to regenerate the data at a distance where signal to noise ratio has gone below the acceptable limit though the distortion in the data may be manageable. So, we are not regenerating the signal because signal has become distorted enough, but we are simply saying the signal to noise ratio is not acceptable anymore and because of that we have to regenerate the data. So, we have to essentially put a repeater at that location. So, here essentially we are seeing now a plot of the data rate and these are the transmission distances in terms of kilometers and these are the different combinations which we have. So, we can have material dispersion LED this could be the curve or you can have a modal dispersion which could be curve and so on. So, this plot essentially tells you that for different combinations of sources and the detectors you can have the different transmission distances. The same thing essentially has been summarized into this slide here. So, what we have done these are now the distances starting from 
very short distances. So, this is 1 to 10 meters, this is 10 to 100 meters, 0.1 kilometer to 1 kilometer, 1 to 3 kilometers, 3 to 10 kilometers, 10 to 50 kilometers, 50 to 100 kilometers and greater than about 100 kilometers. And these are the different data rates which you have start with the very low data rates like 10 k more like audio signal and can go as high as few gigahertz or few gigabits per second. So, these are the different uh, combinations of the source and detectors which we get. So, here we are having S LED which is surface light emitting diode and a multimode fiber. Recall multimode fiber has a large dispersion. So, this can essentially work for low data rates and also can work only very short distances. So, a surface LED and multimode fiber combination is a good combination for something like local area networks because these are the kind of thing which you are talking about are the low data rate which are there on the ethernet kind of structures and where distances also are small on local areas. So, this is a good combination. When the distance become large even for low data rates you require large power and then you have to go to the source which is LD laser diode though dispersion may not be very significant. So, we can still use multimode fiber, but the source has to be laser diode because the power requirement is large. Then we are having the other extreme which is the large distances and the high data rates and in this situation essentially one has to take the source which is giving high power which is laser diode and then you require low dispersion also because the signals are going to travel over very long distances which is this. So, we require a combination which is laser diode and the single mode optical fiber. So, essentially what this plot gives is the combination of source and the fiber for the different distances and for different data rates. So, with this help of this now and with the help of the calculation for the transmitter parameter, receiver parameters and the optical fiber, one can essentially find the location of the repeater. Now, what does the repeater consist of? At the repeater essentially what we are doing is we receive the light and since now the signal to noise ratio has reached to non acceptable level or deterioration is enough. Essentially, we have to electrically regenerate our data. So, essentially what we have to do at the repeater is we have to receive the signal. So, a repeater has a receiver which receives the optical signal, converts to electronics, cleans it, regenerates the data electronically then it regenerated data is given to optical source transmitter which converts the electrical signal into optical signal which is now given further to the next section. So, essentially what we are saying is that a optical transmitter is placed with back to back with the receiver to make a repeater. So, we are having what is called the optical repeater and what essentially this is doing is it is having a receiver here and it is having a transmitter here. The signal is received from here detected converted into electronics clean supplied to the transmitter and the signal is sent again in the optical form from here. So, essentially an optical repeater 
is a back to back receiver transmitter combination. So, you have a substantial cost now in a repeater because you require the entire electronics which you will require on the receiver side and you will also have the transmitters which are exactly at the starting point. So, for a long length of the link when we talk about essentially we are going to put transmitter and receiver periodically on a long optical communication link. So, installing a repeater actually is an expensive option. But since we do not have any alternative, if the even if signal to noise ratio goes down or signal is distorted, any of these two cases, essentially we give the signal to the repeater and signal is regenerated and converted into light again. However, if you ask this question that suppose you are not in optical domain, suppose we were in the electronics domain. Suppose we are talking about let us say a radio communication link and suppose at some point in the link the signal to noise ratio goes below the acceptable limit, but the signal distortion is manageable. Would we regenerate the signal at that location and the answer is no, we will not do that. Since the signal distortion is still manageable, only signal to noise ratio is gone down. So, we will try to add an amplifier at that location and then beyond that point again signal can travel whenever again if signal to noise ratio goes down, but if the distortion is acceptable, we can put another amplifier at that location and we can go on putting amplifiers in the radio communication link. Why then we have to put a repeater in an optical communication system? And the answer to this is that till about a decade back, there was no good optical amplifier available. So, even in those situations where a simple amplifier would have sufficed, we had to put a repeater because there was no suitable optical amplifier. But if you are having a situation where signal to noise ratio becomes a problem, essentially we can use an amplifier, optical amplifier and the entire process of conversion of the signal from optical to electrical back to optical that essentially can be avoided. So, we will discuss the optical amplifiers as we process, but just to give you a feel how many for example, amplifiers one could install in a typical link and how important the amplifier invention is in the optical communication link. Let us say I am using a, a transmitter of laser and let us say that rise time for the transmitter is negligibly small. So, let us say T T x is very close to 0. Most of the essentially rise time is coming let us say from the optical fiber and let us consider an optical fiber which is single mode optical fiber. Let us say the transmitter is transmitting a power which is let us say 0 dBm that is 1 milliwatt 0 1 milliwatt. And the minimum detectable power which I require here is let us say minus 40 dBm. And a typical fiber has a loss let us say about 0.3 dB per kilometer. So, if you calculate now the power budget length Lp maximum assuming that there are no splices and other things just for simple calculation this would be approximately this 0 which is Ps 
this is PR. So, PS minus PR, so minus minus 40. divided by this thing which is 0 0.3 dB per kilometer. So, we get about approximately about 100 kilometer as the link length. And that is the typical situation which you see in the optical communication link because that is the typical power which we transmit that is the power which is required. So, that means the signal to noise ratio becomes unacceptable beyond a distance of about 100 kilometer. Let us say this fiber is a single mode optical fiber where let us say dispersion is let us say 1 picosecond per kilometer per nanometer. And let us say I have a transmitter here which has a spectral width sigma lambda which is 0 0.1 nanometer. And let us say I am transmitting now the data rate of 1 gigabits per second. So, here data is 1 gigabits per second. So, that means the bit duration now is 10 to the power minus 9 1 nanosecond. So, my T b in this case is 10 to the power minus 9. The dispersion is this per kilometer per nanometer. So, over per kilometer we have this multiplied by spectral width. 0.1 picosecond is the broadening of the pulse. So, now I have the L uh, R T max which is approximately 10 to the power minus 9 divided by 0.1 picosecond. So, which is 10 to the power minus 12. So, you see this quantity is now something like 10 to the power 4 kilometers. That means, if we consider a DFB kind of laser where the spectral width is 0.1 and a fiber which is having low dispersion 1 picosecond without distortion the signal can go up to about 10,000 kilometers, but signal to noise ratio becomes unacceptable beyond 100 kilometer. So, now we see there is a strong case in this situation for an optical amplifier because that means every 100 kilometer we could have put optical amplifier and we could have gone up to a distance of about 10,000 kilometer and that location then you would have put a repeater because that is where now the signal would have distorted significantly. So, normally in a typical optical communication system most of the links are power budget limited. And that is the reason there is a strong need for an optical amplifier. So, that we can install this optical amplifier instead of repeaters which is much more costlier than amplifier and go on putting this amplifier till we reach to a distance where distortion becomes unbearable and that location we can put a repeater. So, having made now the case for the optical amplifier, then we will see in the following lectures what are the different options which are available for optical amplification and which are the common optical amplifiers which are used in long distance optical communication link.